Good evening, everybody, and welcome to FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live. I am David Carrico, and I'm so excited to be here with my co-host, Brian Reese, bringing you our fourth installment of our Cities Lost in Time series. Tonight's episode is entitled Hawara, Labyrinth of the Fallen Ones. Tonight, we're going to be digging up a city that has been buried for centuries under the sands of Egypt and unlocking the amazing mysteries that we're going to find there and what it means for us right now. And Brian, kudos on the great thumbnail and the intro as always, and it's just such a joy to be able to be with you to uh, do another Cities Lost in Time. We've really been looking forward to this one. Absolutely, David. Looking forward to this one myself. Harara, right? So this one's not even talked about. A lot of people don't even know this place exists, this ancient megalithic site. And I'm looking forward to it, to uh, peeling back the onion and to uh, get the information out to people. There's going to be some information here that I, I personally haven't heard. And I know that there's people out there that I haven't heard. So I'm looking forward to the content. And uh, get your, like I always say, folks, get you a big bucket of popcorn because this is going to be a really good City's Lost in Time, a Harara Labyrinth, or Labyrinth of the Fallen Ones. So, folks, uh, always a pleasure to be here, Brother David. Fourth fourth episode, David. I can't believe it's the fourth one. And here we are tonight. And I'll give the floor back to you, Brother David. And we just want to welcome all of our listeners and welcome all of our people in the chat. And we just welcome all of our new listeners. We know we have a lot of new listeners tuning in for the first time. And we welcome you to FOJC Radio. And as we go through the presentation tonight, you're going to see how terribly timely and how much of an impact that this city has had on our culture today. So let's get going. And uh, we're going to begin here. And uh, in our first slide here, it, it is a picture of the book, Dracula, written by Mr. Bram Stoker, and of a book that has had an impact upon our pop culture. Probably this is about as huge as you can get. The whole vampire scenario, it begins right here with this book that was written by Bram Stoker. And what a lot of people don't know about Mr. Bram Stoker is that he was a member of the Golden Dawn. And in there with Mr. Aleister Crowley and the elite occultist of all time. And the concepts in Dracula and in his other novels, they do come straight out of the occult and hardcore uh, black magic. Now, we're going to look at another book that is less known but very impactful that was written by Mr. Bram Stoker. And this is entitled The Jewel of the Seven Stars by Bram Stoker. And I'll read just a little bit here uh, about this book. And I'm reading here from a book that we're going to reference several times this evening, uh, The First Female Pharaoh by Mr. Andrew Collins, a really great book if you're interested in this topic. But he says this, uh, in 2017, cinema audiences were treated to the latest reboot of the classic horror movie franchise, featuring the resurrection of an ancient Egyptian mummy. The Mummy, starring Tom Cruise, was an action-packed thriller that sees the return to life of a princess named Ahamanet. She wrecks havoc across modern-day London before finally being defeated. Ahamanet, however, is just the latest incarnation of a fictional character that appears for the first time in a novel written by the celebrated Irish Gothic novelist Bram Stoker. And in this novel, The Jewel of the Seven Stars, which was the basis of this 2017 mummy with uh, Tom Cruise and Russell Crowe, he goes on to say, Stoker's Egyptian novel tells the story of how an ancient queen and sorceress named Terra is able to return to this world by first overshadowing and then finally replacing the 18-year-old daughter of Abel Trelwini, an English collector of antiquities. Now, where this becomes important to our study of Hawara, Mr. Stoker's novel, The Jewel of the Seven Stars, and this 2017 mummy movie, was based upon the first 
female pharaoh who ruled in Hawara. Her name was Sobekna Pharaoh. And we're going to be talking about this lady tonight, Sobekna Pharaoh, that built the labyrinth here in Hawara. And it's it's just going to be, I think, like Brian said, we're going to bring bringing forth information that's not readily known. And we're going to be tying it together in a way that's going to be very relevant and uh, and a blessing for us. Now, Brian, you have some slides here, and I know I watched this mummy movie again last night, and I know you did also. And uh, take us through these slides and uh, bring us up to speed on uh, this 2017 mummy film with Mr. Cruz and Russell Crowe. Well, the first one here, it it's pretty daunting, right? It says, uh, this is... Uh, the mummy casket, the sarcophagus, right? It says, welcome to the new world, gods of gods and monsters. <laughs> so this the, that's the so-called promo for the, mo the mummy movie, right? Welcome to the new world of gods and monsters. I mean, 2017, that's what's so strange about the year also. And then to understand where we're coming from in life, this Harara uh, and this Pharaoh. So according to this, well, the movie flick, the uh yes i said flick <laughs> the woman has to have so-called essence from a living after the mummification of any of the movies that that have come out in this series but this is the last one i think that came out in 2017 they always have to have the mummy or always has to have like another living body to basically take out the essence and you know and then on this particular movie she says rise like she every time she basically kisses a man or that's what i've seen on the film she will pick out men and have them rise up like zombies and she takes the essence and then she turns back and she starts manifesting back into a human well human flesh so to speak and what's so bizarre about it is you can see on the on her face and her markings and the tattoos etc she has it's i mean mesopotamian i mean some of it looks like samaritan in my in my and then enochian in the angelic language and and then another thing that really creeps me out is the casket alone, the sarcophagus, looks like something off a of Jeeper Creepers flick. And it kind of looks like yeah. something of an aqua, aqua life, right? Of Atlantis, of Atlantis narrative. It almost looks yeah. a, Atlantean or an aqua marine life, like a mermaid to a certain level. But what was so bizarre about this movie, at the beginning of the flick, yes, I said flick again, uh, the film, it says, I remember it was like 30 seconds in. It was introducing the program. It says, no joke, it says, there was a little uh, plug in there. It says, death is but the doorway of new life. We live today, we shall live again. In many forms shall we return. And it says, Egyptian prayer of resurrection. And I thought that was just, they put that 20, 30 seconds in after they do all the, you know, the production crew and everything, promote Universal and all that. And then that's the first thing they pop up on it. And then another thing that's really intriguing is she chooses Tom Cruise. So basically Tom Cruise dies, but he, here's the thing. Here's the funny part. Well, not funny, but there's these soldiers that he goes and he accidentally falls in because he's a treasure hunter and he accidentally falls in they send an airstrike to a certain location that's way out, not even close to Egypt, and um, they airstrike this area, and so basically a hole opens up and a sinkhole submerges, and then um, you have this female pharaoh chained down with Anubis, literally, I think it was six Anubis statues and literally the archaeologist woman that was part of the film i don't forget the woman's name she said they she actually just comes out and blatantly says that they're watchers right and she comes yeah. out and says there's these chains they're looking around at the the elaborate um uh, as far as the chains and the whole mechanism to keep the the sarcophagus down in this ooze which i'll elaborate i'll watch i'll comment to in a second but to keep her down restrained, right? And this is like a curse. This this woman is just like completely <laughs> given over possession. She she freely wanted to become possessed, and that's a whole nefarious thing in itself. But what was so baffling, You the woman says there's six watchers, so it's Anubis watching this sarcophagus. Well, Tom Cruise accidentally, well, he doesn't accidentally, he looks at the pulley system, he shoots it, and then all of a sudden it pulls the sarcophagus up in the air and then they're looking around when they fall down into this so-called pit that's a tomb. There's mercury everywhere. There's mercury all over the place. And 
I remember the archaeologist, she said, she goes, Mercury in ancient Egypt was supposed to keep the spirits away. That's what she said during the flick in the film. And I'm like, that's so strange, you know, and I'll, I'll get to that here in a minute. But it's so strange that the, the there was Mercury pouring everywhere and they found this chamber where she was just embedded and the whole tomb was just embedded in Mercury. And I thought that was so crazy. What do you think, David, just on the Mercury uh, aspect? We've done many f- programs on the yeah. new series, yeah. is our new series here, City Lost in Time, talking about Mercury. What do you think about that, David? Well, and the big thing that this brings to our mind is the fact that when the German scientists were developing their exotic weaponry and uh, flying machines and technology, they went back to the Vedas and they literally found in the instruction on the Vimana how that they used a mercury-based fuel. And this was used in the in the German bell of the day clock. And uh, this is so significant. And this has been found, you know, we've talked about this, this mercury has been found in these Egyptian tombs, it's been found in South America, even in Kentucky, in our area, there's been mercury found in Indian mounds. And this is a clear indication of an extremely sophisticated uh, level of technology. And in this whole movie, we see these common scenarios we've seen in our cities lost in time in South America of the soul snatching scenario, literally tearing people's souls out. This is something that's been uh, on the forefront a lot. And this whole idea of the return of the dead and uh, the return of the Nephilim, the reanimators and uh, the return of the fallen ones and where this becomes very relevant uh, with Hawara. Uh, I'll read from page 237. This is from the book, uh, The First Female Pharaoh by Andrew Collins. And he writes, so following the death of Neferopta, Amenhet IV left any remaining construction work at the site of the labyrinth to his sister, Sobek Neferu. She would probably have begun work there immediately upon the death of her father, probably continued to add to the complex up until the end of her reign. The question then becomes, what exactly was she doing there? What was she attempting to achieve? What exactly will require us to better understand how this mammoth project was executed and how the female monarch was able to establish the labyrinth quite literally as the center of the known world? And this is what we're going to be going back and looking at the city lost in time. What this female pharaoh, Sebek Nefaru, did and the labyrinth that she built and how she made Hawara the very center of the world. It, tremendously important. And this is truly a city lost in time. And we're going to be digging it up wow. and uh, really taking a look at this labyrinth. Uh, just exactly what it was and the significance of this young lady and the and the city. I want to point something out real quick. I know that we're going to go into something else here before we get away from the mummy movie all the way together here. So um, I want to bring this to and see what you ta- you're taking on it too, David. So they're in the plane. They got the sarcophagus. They extracted her from the um, from the tomb. Do you remember the, the black crows that come in and destroy the propellers of the plane and crash it, right? Well, you remember yeah. what Tom Cruise does. He acts, he actually takes the arche, or the archaeologist and puts a parachute on her back. And everybody else gets thrown out of the plane because the plane starts getting ripped to pieces. And he sacrifices himself, and he deploys the parachute and shoots her out. She's the only one that survives. Well, little did she know, all the bodies was laying, you know, they found all the bodies after the wreckage. And he gets resurrected because she chooses yeah. him, right? This demonic yeah. woman chooses Tom Cruise to be supposedly, let's just say, yeah. it's almost got this Lilith kind of connection, in my opinion. Almost got a Lilith yeah. resemblance. And yeah. it's just, there was one other slide It has, she is real, the mummy. You know, is she real? You, me and David's going to be just, you know, describing that tonight. But the... And she had the sword or the dagger. That's where she made this, uh, let's just say this... Uh, uh, oath to one of what was it Seth I think one of the creatures one of the demons mm-hmm. that she becomes this let's just say this immortal 
so to speak, in revenge. But I know you're going to get into that a little bit more in here. But I just want to point that out, the sacrifice, and then his his judgment, his curse. He's cursed. Tom Cruise is cursed now. And and yeah. and she has to – she's chosen him to be his – well, I guess to be the helpmate for her to do her, man, you know, manipulation through the earth now in the, in the modern yeah. time of 2017. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he actually takes his own life with the ritual dagger Mm -hmm. and then he comes back as this more than human entity that will reign with Sobek Neferu. Now we mentioned that Sobek Neferu built the labyrinth and we're going to be showing you a lot about the labyrinth, what it was and what that means to us today. And we're going to read from the historian Herodotus. And this is from the great books of the Western world by Britannica, volume six. And I'm going to read from his writings a little bit on page 80. And he says, uh, Herodotus writes, to bind themselves yet more closely together, it seemed good to them to leave a common monument. In the pursuit of this resolution, they made the labyrinth, which lies a little above Lake Morris in the neighborhood of the place called the City of Crocodiles. I visited this place and found it to surpass description. For if all the walls and the outer great works of the Greeks could be put together in one, they would not equal for their labor or expense this labyrinth. And yet the temple of Ephesus is a building worthy of note, and so is the temple of Samos. The pyramids likewise surpass description and are severally equal to a number of the greatest works of the Greeks, but the labyrinth surpasses the pyramids. Now, that's quite a statement by someone that saw this firsthand, that it was far beyond any of the buildings of the Greeks and even the Great Pyramid itself. It was something, and it was indeed the center of the known world that was brought together by this female pharaoh, Sebekna pharaoh. Going on, he says, it has 12 courts, all of them rooted with gates exactly opposite one another, six looking to the north and six to the south. A single wall surrounds the entire building. And he goes on to just an amazing description of this elaborate structure that Mr. Herodotus said was far surpassing the Great Pyramid in all of its splendor. We'll read from another book here. This book is entitled Egypt, The Image of Heaven by Wilhelm Zittman. And Mr. Zittman writes writes this on page 137 as he writes about the labyrinth. He said, the structure next to the pyramid of Hawara has functioned as a temple of the dead. Yet its architectural design was so utterly uncommon that it became known as the labyrinth, and since antiquity, it has become associated with the Knossos labyrinth on Crete. The Cretan labyrinth was the prison of the monster or demon Minotaur, constellation bull, begotten by Parsife, queen of the Simon legendary King Minos. In antiquity, the labyrinth was linked intricably with the dwelling of a demon. Now, this is a huge concept, and here we have the prototype of all of their labyrinths, and probably the most famous is the one in Crete where the Minotaur was, but this was the prototype, and the concept of all of these labyrinths is that in the middle of them, there's a horrible monster and a demon that dwells. He goes on to say, for this reason, only one star exists that qualifies for a correlation with this pyramid and the labyrinth of Awara, namely Agol, the star is called the demon star, Algol, the demon, the demon star, and the blinking demon. So we have a tremendous association with something very dark and very ominous that here in in all of the labyrinths, they were built to be kind of a prison house where they can control some kind of a supernatural entity. And here at Hawara, this was the the mother of them all, so to speak. And they referenced there the, uh, the labyrinth in Crete. And in there was the legendary monster, the Minotaur. And we're going to take a look at that. And you can... Uh, 
Just give the people a little rundown there on the Minotaur there, Brian. So the Minotaur, it's kind of interesting. You know, we, we could, first of all, if we would go, you know, speaking of the Labyrinth of the Fallen Ones, you know, we've, we well, you have done that also on the Midnight Ride, and we've talked about it here on FLJC Underground Church, uh, talking about Enoch and the Book of Enoch, speaking about the Fallen, uh, not only uh, manipulating uh, humans, uh, manipulating other things, cattle, animals, you know, etc., other beasts of the field and insects, etc. And I think the Minotaur would fit a prime example of uh, some type of manipulation of some shape or form. And when you look in this labyrinth, it's kind of interesting that it's a minotaur um brother adam um no joke used to live in texas well there is uh literally a park that has the minotaur and it looks just like a labyrinth and it's very complex and it's just you can see cows or bulls running out of this rock-like shelter like it blasting out of the wall and it reminds me of the minotaur and it's also close to the 33 degree parallel and, you know, it's very close into the Dallas area. So that alone is compelling. We put that on the shelf and uh, check that off the list. There's something going down there. But then getting back to the whole concept of the spiritual applications, you see this this bull, you see this whole, uh, we'll going to get into it more into the program, but you see this bull, you see it chasing either, you know, female, male, and there's this dominance uh, factor into it. But if you, I've seen so many flicks, so your movies, TV shows, etc., that uh, show if you can defeat the Minotaur, you have to do sacrifice, right? You have to do pull off some yeah. kind of sacrifice uh, to to basically overrule him. But he would never gets he never gets defeated. He just miraculously will disappear. And another thing that comes to mind is the uh, it looks very similar to Chronicles of Narnia and all the concepts with the Hollywood narrative when it comes to that, but. It's basically the center, the demons in the center of the labyrinth, and you have to go through the maze and try to overpower him. And, and be, he's a subtle, just like the serpent in the garden. He's subtle, he's intelligent, but you have to be more wit, you know, as far as uh, more intelligent and more of a higher IQ to outsmart him, so to speak, to uh, basically run from his wrath that he's getting ready to dispel, to, you know, he's going to annihilate you, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, We'll give you a little more context on the Minotaur. I'll read a little bit from Man, Myth, and Magic. And as what we evolve in our understanding of Hawara, it was a center of the production of animal-human hybrids. It was also the one of the oldest known places, and some think the origin of the Orphite snake cult. And we're going to see a lot of this half-animal, half-human as we, we unpack the mysteries here of Hawara. But concerning the Minotaur, and this is, you know, this is graphic, but it says here in Man, Myth, and Magic that Pasiphae, wife of King Minos, conceived a passion for a bull, sent in answer to the prayers of Minos. Instead of sacrificing this bull as he had promised, Minos sent it away among his herds and sacrificed another one. His punishment for this piece of deception was the unnatural passion of his wife. The minotaur had the head of a bull, but the rest of him was human. The labyrinth supposedly built by Daedalus was recognized in antiquity as an imitation of the Egyptian labyrinth which in turn was generally believed to be sacred to the sun. The dances in the labyrinth were connected in antiquity with the Roman game of Troy, performed by bands of armed use on horseback. And we see developing here a very, very dark attempt to control very powerful animal-human mutations and to, to produce these creatures. And we're going to see that this was accomplished by ancient rituals of black magic from the Egyptian book of the dead. Now, I'm going to read again from the book, The First Female Pharaoh by Andrew Collins, and we're going to get down to their understanding of how they transform themselves to enable themselves to do these dark wonders and these dark miracles, if you will. It says... Uh, and here we're talking about Sebekna Pharaoh. And the reason why this woman 
was able to become the female Pharaoh, the ruler of all Egypt and the center of the whole world to build something that was beyond even the magnificence of the pyramids or any of the building of the Greeks. According to her, she was able to do that because of black magic rituals she performed that were found in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Um, Mr. Collins writes considering concerning Sebek Neferu, like Hathor, who had swallowed seven cobras to gain the power of the Heka magic, she too had invoked the same power to ensure the outcome of her own future destiny, and through this act had risen to become the first woman ever to wear the double crown of upper and lower Egypt. And it gets very specific. These are very specific black magic rituals. And when we wrote our book called The Egyptian Masonic Satanic Connection, we actually connected things that are current in satanic ritual abuse with the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And we had children in middle school that were describing to us rituals from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And they could not have done that had they not actually been through these things and experienced it. So this is something very ancient, and it's something very dark. And this is actually uh, from the coffin text. This is called, and this is actually spelled 612 from the Egyptian coffin text, and it's to become Hathor. And this is the ritual that Sebekne Pharaoh went through to become this powerful individual to rule all of Egypt. She sa It says this, this is the actual text. It says, how happy are those who see the festival in this place of mine. I am seated on a throne of Porphy, the scarab beetle. I give judgment in company with the seven cobras. I have swallowed the seven urea because I am Hathor, mistress of rams, the serpent who laughs, the cobra god of the north, the great wild owl of the mansion. And in their, in their, religion, Hathor swallowed these seven cobras. And to become Hathor, Sebek Nefero swallowed these seven cobras. And I just wondered, you know, were they little bitty cobras? What's going on here? You know, are we going to swallow a live cobra? Did she kill them for us? I don't know. But it's absolutely bizarre here of swallowing seven cobras and going through this dark ritual from the Egyptian Book of the Dead to come forth with uh, as this super ruler. And you know, one thing the Bible does not do, the Bible never denies the reality of the power of the dark world. When we look at Egypt, when Moses confronted Pharaoh, the Egyptian magicians could duplicate most of the miracles that Moses did. There was a line that they could not go to. But there is definitely power on the dark side, but the power of God is so far superior and when we are in Christ and underneath the covering of the blood, that power of darkness has no power over us. But you better, if you are not in Christ, you need to be afraid. You need to be very, very afraid because these things are loose in the world right now. These ancient spirits are going to be released very soon in a way that's absolutely unprecedented. So this is just absolutely uh Amazing. One more thing here, Brian, and I want you to weigh in here. This is this is important. Uh, it says here in Mr. Collins' book, all this is important because the seven cobras that bestow the power of Heka on those who swallow them well have been synonymous with what are known as the seven Hathors. These were the seven spirits under the command of the goddess. And we see these seven spirits, these are re reiterated through Kabbalah. We see them in the Kabbalistic and the Gnostics writings of these spirits that rule the seven heavens. One of the big distinctions between biblical cosmology and the Gnostic and the Kabbalistic, we see three heavens in scripture. We see the first heaven, the air with which we breathe. We see the second heaven, which is the heavenly luminaries we look up at, and the third heaven, which is there above the firmament where the Lord dwells. But these seven spirits go all the way back to these snake spirits 
of Hathor. So what what do what do you think here, Brian? Well, the first thing I think of is um Stargate SG one. I think uh, Hathor is a as a big dominant force on that uh, TV series and Hathor is spoken about and she dominates the land through the so-called space and the dominance of humanity and all that. And she literally, uh, I think she breeds snakes and everything on that. And they call them the Gould and they, they swallow them. They wrap around their neck and it's basically a demon or basically they call them gods, little G gods, and they take over the human host. And that's one thing to throw in. This is literally Hathor and another thing is, is the seven. You were referencing uh, seven in heaven, the seven uh, snakes that she's uh, supposedly eating, which is sick. Um, there's seven Stargate coordinates. Like they say, Chevron deploy. Like there's seven, and there's eight later on in the program, but there's seven at the original. Yeah. Isn't that kind of crazy that the you got the spiraling of the serpent, the kundalini, all these different things, the astral projection, all that stuff is, is incorporated here. And this Hathor character is very, uh, let's just say she's a very scary lady. And then another thing, too, just speaking of the feast, the first uh, female pharaoh, and it kind of interesting that this character and such a dominance in Egypt, isn't it kind of a wild that Cleopatra was the last to serve in Egypt? And then she was a female. Yeah. And it kind of bizarre how those those similarities and connections that she had dominance. Yeah. yeah, just wanted to bring all that up. That's, that's where my head is on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. And um, Jillian Stone just recently up on our uh, Underground Church YouTube channel did a presentation on Cleopatra. And there's a lot. We could do a lot of talk about the the correlations there. Now, what we want to speak to here is, and you see so many things we see here at, here at Hawara. You know, we, we go back to a time where this was the occult power of the entire world world and we see always to understand the dark realm and what satan is doing and jesus said that we are to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove so it doesn't hurt to know what your enemy's doing it gives us the ability to pray targeted prayers to defeat the evil one now let's look and and to see understand what the dark world is doing if you see what the kingdom of god is it's an inverse reverse imitation of what god is doing now let's look in some scripture here that ties in with what we're talking about in acts 16 verses 16 through 18 and it came to pass as we went to prayer a certain damsel damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which shewed us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her the same hour. Now that word for divination there is the Greek word pythos. This is where we get our word python. And I'm sure that all of us, we've seen the movies where they're playing the flute and the cobra comes up out of the basket and it's doing this, you know. And the the cobra, what, the way it would bob its head, it would literally put people, they would play their, their instruments and the cobras would come up. It would put them into an altered hypnotic state. And in these oracles, like the oracle at Delphi, they would they would have huge serpents. There was a, one of the Indiana Jones movies, I think, had the huge serpent down in the pit in this temple. Well, that's that was really the way it was. And they would use these snakes and the music and the way that Bob has said to it go into an altered state. And they would prophesy, you know, and these are the snake spirits of divination that go back from this understanding of Hathor. And we see the same imitations of it. We can see the same things we've been in our cities lost in a time we've looked at uh, in South America, uh, Chicken Itza and Tenochtitlan. We, we see parallels of this all over. This is the basic religion of Satan. Now, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, John to the seven churches were in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. 
Now, that's what we want to look at for just a moment. The seven spirits before the throne of God that the Apostle John saw. Now, let's see what these are. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, we see specifically what these are and what they do from the prophet Zechariah, and these are at work to build the true temple of God. These seven spirits before the throne, and we see also in the book of Revelation, the angels of the seven churches, and these are heavenly messengers that will enable us to bring forth and produce the work of the kingdom. Let's look at Zechariah 3, verse 8 and 9. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and my fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, on upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the engraving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. And in four and ten, it becomes very clear what these are. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. And as Zerubbabel there labored to rebuild that second temple in the days of the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, the seven spirits that were before the throne, the eyes of the Lord that go forth into all of the earth, they are enabling the Israel of God to do the work of the kingdom. The reverse of that are these seven spirits of Hathor. They're building a temple also, but it's not the temple of God, it's the temple of the devil. Here we see spiritual warfare in direct conflict. The, the kingdom of Satan against the kingdom of God, and we have to be absolutely sure where we're coming down in this. And this is just such an important uh, concept for us to understand. Absolutely, David. And I have something to throw in there real quick. Do you think this is where they, you know, not to put down these organizations and stuff, but do you think this is where they come up with the snake handling when it comes into the churches and stuff? Is there something connected to that? I mean, some nefarious, you know, correlation yeah. with that, the origins of it. They just don't understand. They're tempting it. You know, when they, and some people have died. Some people have oh, yeah. literally, oh, yeah. you know, been poisoned and sick, you know, almost you know, losing extremities, et cetera. So what is that? Yeah. You know, that's what, you know, you're tempting with, you know, you're, you're playing with fire, you know? So I don't know. Just yeah. something to think You'd about. be safer playing with fire, would you? Yeah. And, At least you can put it out. And, and these, <laughs> uh, and a lot of people aren't aware, but there are still uh, snake cults. And I believe in West Virginia, it is still legal to openly have snake churches. And there, I, I believe it's in West Virginia. And there's others that practice the, though it's illegal, we see these uh, snake churches are still around. And if you go back in history into uh, the area of the the era of the 20s and 30s, there were snake revivals that would draw thousands of people that would mm. be held down there in Appalachia and uh, down in those areas. It was a really, really big thing, and it's not of God. This is absolutely a perversion of Scripture. It's nothing but tempting God. And uh, we don't want anyone to think for a minute that any of this snake handling business uh, is anything of the Lord. It is obviously something of the evil one. Now, we'll look at something here by Mr. Zechariah Sitchkin, and we're going to take a little bit deeper look at Hathor, because Hathor is the basis for Sebeknu Pharaoh. She literally became Hathor. In, in the spirit which empowered her to do what she did. And Mr. Sitchkin writes in his book, The Wars of God and Men, it says the Egyptians consider, this is page 148, the Egyptians considered the Sinai Peninsula to have been the domain of Hathor. All the temples and stelas erected by Egyptian pharaohs in the peninsula were dedicated exclusively to this goddess. And like Naharshag in her later years, Hathor 
was also nicknamed the cow and was depicted with cow's horns. But with Hathor also we have claimed, as we have claimed for Ninharsag, mistress of the Great Pyramid, that amazingly but not surprisingly she was. And she was the mistress of the Great Pyramid, and her power at the time of the reign of Sebeknu Pharaoh, she was absolutely the big, the big duck in the pond of the world of evil, you might say. Now, some more background. We'll look here at uh, the Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, and the picture becomes more and more clear of what we're uh, engaged with here. It says here under the article, Hathor, Egyptian mother of the gods and queen of heaven. Now we see that in the book of Jeremiah, don't we? We talk, they, Jeremiah prophesies and rebukes them for worshiping of the queen of heaven. Going on, it says, Hathor was worshiped in Israel in the 11th century BC at her own city of Hazor, which the Old Testament claims Joshua destroyed. Joshua 11, verses 13 and 21. We read that in the scripture. The city totally devoted to uh, Hathor worship was destroyed by Joshua. Good for you, Joshua. Going on, it says, some sources said there were seven Hathors, the holy midwives, associated with the seven heavenly spears. They gave each Egyptian seven souls at birth. Sevenfold Hathor entered medieval myth as fairy godmother and mother goose. Now, I never knew that. But the whole tradition of the fairy godmothers and mother goose, this comes from this mythology of Hathor. It concludes here, like Kali, she drank the blood of gods and men. And that's where it almost always reverts to this ritualistic sacrifice, the the drinking of the blood and the eating of the flesh of human beings that they might uh, acquire the power of them. In the book, The Woman's Dictionary of Symbols and Sacred Objects, it says uh, the Egyptian form of the cherub symbolized the heavenly goddess nut, Hathor, or the celestial cow, having a body covered with eyes. There's our eyes again that are the ripoff of the eyes that are upon the Lamb of God to represent the stars and wings to represent the air. As she was often called a sevenfold deity, the seven Hathors, she passed in dynastic tradition as the seven planetary spirits called cosmocrators or builders. And what we're going to see here as we look deeper into the labyrinth, pardon the pun, but we're going to see that the labyrinth was something that looked upward. There was this alignment to the devil star, as they called it. And there was also an alignment with portals and chambers in the heart of the earth. And this was like a super cosmic board of portals. That was something that has been beyond anything that man has ever constructed. Even beyond that, I believe, uh, that was accomplished by Nimrod at, uh, at the Tower of Babel. Now, in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 4, it says, And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And we know the story, how that Aaron formed the golden calf and the children of Israel worshipped it while Moses was up receiving the law of God. And it wasn't like the Egyptian says, well, let's worship an animal, you know, a dog, a kitty, a toad. But they were doing a specific ritual. The calf was the goddess Hathor. And they fell into this worship of the goddess Hathor while Moses was upon the top of the mountain receiving the law. And this, as we've seen uh, throughout uh, already we've seen the connections between the uh, the minotaur that was half human, half animal. This is connected also in scripture. The worship of Hathor is connected with half animal, half human uh, chimera mutations. And we see this in scripture. 
in 2 Chronicles chapter 11 and verse 15, and he ordained him priest for the high places and the devils and for the calves which he had made. Speaking of the calf worship of Jeroboam that he set up in Dan and Bethel. Now, what we want to note, that word devil, if you look it up in the Strongs, it's number 8163, the satyr. That was half man, half goat. So we see the worship of the calf, representative Hathor, that's carried on with the actual worship of the satyrs. And I believe, and absolutely, I could back this up biblically, that these creatures actually did exist, and that they were actually, these literal entities were worshipped as uh, in, in these uh, dark, dark, dark pagan rituals. Hmm. Just to throw us in here, David, um, it's kind of graphic, but, um, you know, bestiality comes to mind with all this abominations, you know, and the satyrs and stuff. And, you know, if they're, they want to pay homage to these entities back in the day, right? And they, let's just say they have an intellect and a higher IQ than the average human, right? So they're, because their daddies are angelic. So they have a Nephilim blood in them or whatever was going on, this, this biological mess. Well, I think. Wouldn't that just be, well, I know it is. All that stuff's been taught by the 200 watchers that fell down on, on Mount Hermon. And yes, uh, it's all demonic. And the bestiality is coming back around the bend in our in our realm in 2024. And people, you know, they see the, the, the satyrs, the satires, all these different characters, the sirens, the, you know, the mermaids, mermen. And we've been so dumbed down with the, with the corporations and everything to do with, you know, I'm trying to watch what I say, but certain companies in certain places that uh, have bewitched us so to speak and telling us a story a narrative and all these different uh comic book characters whatever and making it out to be folklore and just fairy tales but it's legitimately demonically charged and i think the the first thing that come to my mind was you know bestiality and all that the minotaur yeah. trying to chase the women right chasing the women through the labyrinth and and and, you know, if they catch them, right, it's so much, it's just so much filth and trash there. But what I'm getting at is that that has to be where it comes from. It has to be where these yeah. abominations come from and these teachings, yeah. these origins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the book of Ash, Jasher also, there's text that talk about how that humans, not only was some of this accomplished through bestiality, but some of it was actually accomplished through genetic manipulation that took place by humans in the antediluvian world. And just like we talked about the presence of mercury, the idea that the people that built these tremendous uh, structures were just a bunch of dummies <laughs> that don't know what we know today. Well, let me tell you what, we're just catching up. We're just starting to catch up and we're starting to learn uh, how important it is for us to understand what actually transpired. Now, in this next slide, we have a, one of the depictions of Hathor, the cow goddess. And often she is depicted with these horns with a ball in the middle. You'll see this many times. And this is so significant. And the horns are representative of the planet Venus. Uh, the planet Venus will actually... Uh, as it will move across from being a morning star and an evening star, it will actually draw a set of horns like this. And this actually is symbolic of the goddess just taking over this good old flat earth that we're on. Now, just look at this visual, visual of the horns that are upon the head of Hathor with the ball in the middle. Now, I want to take you to another one of the most ancient megalithic structures and this is at Newgrange, and this is in Ireland. And the dating on Newgrange, my goodness, they take this back. Uh, it's way antediluvian, five, 6,000 BC. It is way, way old. And here we see, just look at what you see. And Brian, this visual is unmistakable right there. You have the, the horns and the ball, just like it is on the top of the goddess Hathor. And this is a signature that what we have here was literally, the Bible tells us that we're coming back into the time where we're going to have a one world government and a one world religion. Well, that was already accomplished in the antediluvian world. And here's just another signature that 
it just shows us that this was indeed the fact. Absolutely. And then one thing that comes to my mind is they're literally taking a larger scale map, let's just say schematic, from the constellations, and then making us, you know, let's just say on top of Hathor's top of her head, they're making a larger thing to communicate with the constellations above, right? So it's as above, so below. Here we yeah, go. We absolutely. have this. Absolutely. We have this energy source that is pinging off of the, let's just say, the ether, the firmament, and it's is pulling in nefarious things for nefarious uh, applications. And this is what they've been doing from a long time way back in the Andalusian world. And I hope I have to agree with you, hundred percent. Yeah, and we were talking last night on the midnight ride about ley lines and earth energies, and uh, and actually. You know, John was brought up the idea last night on the ride that these places are not only they're build over places where there's earth energies and but actually there are ancient entities that are actually buried in this place. And many of them, this is actually marking a spot where these are being confined and punished. We got into that a little bit last night on the midnight ride. But going down to this next slide, we see the same symbolism, and it's unmistakable, in the Serpent Mound in Ohio. And like here at Newgrange, you see the horns encompassing the ball. And here at the Serpent Mound, not far from us over in Ohio, we see the mouth of the snake encompassing the ball. And all, and of course, there it is. This is the same, the seven snakes of Hathor, of uh, this, of uh, the Orphite snake cult. It, it has some of its earliest beginnings and propagation all over the earth right here from this city lost in time uh, here in Harawa. Yeah, and the one thing to throw in here too, um, I have not spoke about this ever, but we are, this is all exclusive content here on a new series Lost in Time here on their uh, Harawa program. There's everywhere you go, especially in my neck of the woods, there's a, let's just say it's called Micah. And that is a conductor that is used today for electrical applications and everything else that we use for what we use in our modern day tech that's inside these mounds. So riddle that one and wonder what that's there for. If there's no, no significance, why is there abundance of mica, M-I-C-A, in these mounds, right? So the New Grange, Super Mound more than likely has them all the way up and down the Ohio Valley. These sacred ley lines... They're all communicating. They're in a diluvian. I agree a hundred thousand percent. And they're still, I think they're still, I think they're still communicating all the way to Giza. I think they're still communicating underground, some shape or form. And uh, like you all spoke about on the midnight ride, I think they're just digging everything back up and then they, they confiscate it. Right. So it's always like, you know, Robin Hood, so to speak. So they, they're yeah. uh, doing these narratives with the Smithsonian and whatnot, but uh, yeah, it's pretty baffling. And we're looking at things here that concern communications. And uh, another whole layer of this is the obelisk. And the obelisk had quartz crystals in them that were capable of storing information, uh, transmitting energy. Uh, it could, uh, it would be capable of a communication device. It would be capable of weaponry. It could be used as a weapon. And the, what we see from these sites, and you know, here at Hawara, this is um, the mother of all these, of all of the, we've looked at a lot of amazing things, and we're going to look at more amazing things, but this labyrinth, you know, according to Herodotus itself, it was over beyond the pyramids and beyond it all, and now we're going to begin to look at the, the actual uh, drawings and recreations of the labyrinth itself. And we're going to be looking at some of the drawings by a fellow by the name of Athanasius Kircher. And Athanasius Kircher was a Jesuit scholar. And he was actually, uh, some call him the father of Egyptology. And this Jesuit knew way too much about way too much. We'll just say that. But Mr. Kircher did a drawing here. And one of these drawings is of the Minotaur. And another one of these drawings is the drawing that he reproduced according to the description of Herodotus of the uh, labyrinth that was built by Sebek du Ferro at Harawa. But Brian, take us through these slides and uh, uh, let's get all up to speed on just exactly what this labyrinth looked like 
and we'll get some ideas of exactly how it functioned. So this first slide here uh, with Mr. Kircher with the, uh, let's just say the bull, the minotaur in the middle, this slide reminds me of the, let's just say cathedrals that are made since Brother David just spoke of Jesuit. It reminds me of the floor plan. There's floor schematics with, uh, let's just say, that look very similar to what is on the screen here, but will minus, minus uh, subtracting the bull in the middle. But when it comes to electrical mechanisms and whatnot, let's just say there's a term, I can't use it on here on for, I got to uh, respect YouTube, YouTube policies, but there is these types of architect work on the floor schematics and everything built in these ancient cathedrals and especially in the Vatican and whatnot. I just wanted to document that. It's pretty, pretty, pretty wild stuff, David, pretty wild stuff. So continue on. Um, the next one that Brother Dave was referring to, the Labyrinth of Egypt with Mr. Kircher here. This one, me and David was uh, pretty baffled on. Uh, here's a zoomed in screenshot of it. As you can see here, it is well, let's just say it has uh, 12 different, is it 12? That is 12, that is correct. 12 different boxes. And me and Brother David have uh, looked into this as far as there's 12 zodiacs. And whatever Mr. Yeah. Kircher was on, <laughs> and wherever, whatever type of plane he was on, I don't know what kind of, how much he's had to drink or whatever, but he was communicating with subtypes of spirits and communications because a human standpoint, even back in the day, could not pull off this endeavor. So one thing that Riddle, that just in the back of my mind, I can't even, I can't even process it because I'm thinking, where are we at today in 2024? If Mr. Kircher's pulling this off with, you know, with, let's just say, ancient mathematics and arithmetic and then especially it looks like geometric shapes and geometry on a highest order but then the middle it literally looks like well let's just face it, it looks like a pyramid and but then another thing i want to take in consideration it looks like a motherboard and what do you think david i mean it looks like a motherboard on a computer the schematic of what you would get and there's so much it's real elaborate the complexity of this of this with Mr. Kircher here, it's it's uh, this picture on the screen doesn't do it justice. But what do you think, David? What are we looking at here? Is the zodiac connection? I mean, constellations, obviously. But what do we what do we really what's going on here with Mr. Kircher? What what did he do with this slide? I mean, with this twelve zodiacs, where, where's that connection come in? At? Well, what I believe is that this is the epitome of the expression "as above, so below," as. Uh, we, we've already read that it is aligned with this devil star that they call, as they call it, and it is also to be the home of a devil in the middle of it. Now, we have the 12 squares that represent the 12 constellations. This is like a, uh, a stargate through the 12 constellations. And also here we see in the center of the labyrinth, it goes down. Mm -hmm. There is also portals in the heart of the earth and there's portals in the, in the celestial realm. And around the outside, we have 48 gods. There are 48 pagan deities that were invoked by the Egyptians to gain access into certain areas, whether they be in the heavenly realms. And we're going to be looking at some specific rituals in the Egyptian Book of the Dead that talk about connecting entities down through the heart of the earth. Hmm. So what we have, this is just like, uh, and it is, it's just like a spiritual computer board that accesses the the these these doorways and portals, whether they be above or whether it be below. This is something that is, I think it's even beyond Babel, uh, that uh, it is just really something to look at. And it, and it, well, one thing too, it reminds me of the CPU. That's what it, if you tear down a computer besides the motherboard, it is like the heart and the brain of the whole computer is the CPU. It reminds me of that so much. Um, the next slide, the labyrinth of Egypt of Hawara here, there's a, there's a con, it's a concept uh, picture here. So, what Brother David just talked about, where we have the 12 constellations. I just want to point this out. So you have this motherboard concept, computer concept here. You know, we're looking at a larger scale mechanism. It's kind of it's kind of funny. You know, back in the 70s, they had uh, so-called computers that was big as warehouses, David. They could only process what mega, it wasn't even kilobytes. You know, it was just 
Yeah. And, you know, they it's kind of like they mocking us, right? They're mocking us. But this particular side here, uh, when you have six, when you have six of these uh, boxes and six on this on these on this left to right, like Brother David said, I think it was north and south. It reminds me of our Karnak, the uh, the city of the lost skulls. I think it's what we uh, what we uh, titled that that uh, broadcast. But uh, south and north, and you have the pyramid, and you have the six on one side, six on the other. Since we have twelve, so we have twelve zodiacs. We have our twelve zodiacs. And then one thing I want to point out is when you're passing the the six on the left and six on the right, there's these four little boxes here and four little boxes there. You know, I could go down a big rabbit hole with that, but what I'm getting at, the resemblance of this site reminded me of Karnak very well. Yeah. It just it and yeah. an, an ancient Stargate is what I thought, the first thing I thought of, and what they're using to do nefarious things. And I don't know what they've done. I think they're even harnessing, you know, the angel, the watcher angel knowledge, maybe possibly, like we've been referring to in this program. Or if they're each one individually goes through the entrance there and becomes superhuman. I don't know. You know, I could, it's all speculation, but based off the concept art here and whoever rendered it and based off what it would have looked like back in the day, it looks very similar to what a, what a smaller scale, what we've come down to today. We can, I mean, David, they're gotten so much more advanced in the technology here lately. I mean, we went yeah. from like milli, you know, kilobytes, megabytes, you know, gigabytes, terabytes, and we—I mean, on a smaller scale. Look at our phones. Look at everything. We, it's so it's so uh, narrowed down and, and minimized to a small confined space. So, but this, this is on a different level. I mean, we're talking. Who cares about cell phone towers? Who cares about all that? This bad boy. I mean, we're literally harnessing the powers of the of of the firmament of the the constellations all in one little you know isolated area. Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty baffling. Um, the next one is just a 3D rendering. I wanted to point this out for the program. Um, 3D concept here. Got a got a rectangle square around. I got the pyramid at the top on the top left and the far left of the corner there. Once again, CPU. And then later on, I'll show maybe if we have time, there's Google Earth imagery. There's a water source. Hey, Brian, some in the chat are saying you're muted. Are you sure you're not muted? I'm not muted. Okay, very good. Yeah, Sorry I'm not, to interrupt you. No, no, you're fine. I'm not muted. Okay, very good. I don't think very I am. Good. Yeah, but uh, thank you all for thank you all for um, staying on me though. <laughs> but uh, I can check that real quick. And that's fine. I want to make sure that we y'all can hear me really well. So testing, testing. Sorry about the little hiccup, folks. If I'm in the um, if I'm in uh, if in the last few minutes, I apologize for that. So but go right ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, you're fine. Um. So the water source around the locations, every time you have to have a water coolant or a water as far as a fan system with the computer, so the computer and everything communicates, like hence, I wonder, and this is just, you're going to hear this on here, I wonder if they have some kind of nuclear fusion with seawater and fresh water underneath this particular site, and to this day, the labyrinth, whatever's underneath, like me and Brother David spoke about with uh, Mr. Kircher there, as above, so below, and what's underneath, based off his schematic, based off his knowledge of wherever he's getting it from, and his rendering there with the 48 uh, gods written around him on the border, what if there's a seawater and freshwater concept that's underground, and they're able to do a nefarious thing, which, which today would be nuclear fusion, and I can assure you, not too far from my home, not too far from my area, they're doing this. Military applications and everything. So, I mean, look, I know, I know some people. But I just know some people that I've met that are talking about these applications in the last few years to to uh, generate something. And they're very hush-hush about it. But I digress and I'll move forward here. But isn't that interesting that all these places, these Indian mounds, New Grange, I say I've, um, I'm trying to remember if there's a water source, all the Indian mounds, all these megalithic sites. Yes, everybody will say, well, Brian... You know, just like the Karnak series. Well, if there's water, there's life. Absolutely. I 100% agree. But these sites are complex and they're strategically placed certain water sources, which people say, well, there's, you know, you got gold, silver, mercury, iron. We have all these things that are all collaborated into certain type of water streams and stuff. And I would riddle, I would, I would, this is all speculation, David, but I wonder 
in this particular site, I wonder if there's a powder keg of mercury underneath this land. If you was to excavate this land, is there still this connection with mercury? Since we talked about that earlier with the Chichen Itza, Chichen Itza, all the, all the pyramids, mercury everywhere. Wonder if this site alone has mercury in abundance to pull off some type of endeavor and it's just been laying dormant or they're using it to this day. What do you think, David? Well, I couldn't, I haven't been able to document it. I've never read it, but I would just absolutely believe it to be the case that there was mercury there. Now, what has been found there, you know, you mentioned nuclear energy and a lot of people will think that, you know, we've jumped off the banana boat talking about nuclear energy at a site like this, but very near this area in the Sahara desert, there has been the green glass called trinitite that was found. Now, trinitite got its name from the Trinity uh, nuclear test site. When in the 40s, we did the first nuclear test before we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, and it was the Trinity uh, nuclear testing site. Now, when that blast was set off, they found something there that had never been seen before. And it actually created a new substance that was like a green glass where the, the heat was so intense that it melted the sand into a green glass-like substance. And they called it Trinitite. This same green glass has been found in the Sahara Desert, not far at all from this site at Hawara. So the absolute possibility of uh, technology, not only equal to, but beyond anything that we have. When we talk about, uh, we're talking about things here and it bleeds over also into the concept of star forts that the, with the star forts and the obelisks that not only were they free energy, but also uh, like free communication that they were able to literally uh, communicate uh, without wires, kind of like the uh, concept of the Tesla free energy towers. But th these are all the things that we have here. And, um, I'll read a, a, a comment, and this is the take of Mr. Andrew Collins from the book on the first female Pharaoh, and he this is his ideas about uh, the actual function of the labyrinth. This is on page 255. He says, in summary, then, it would appear feasible that Sebekna Pharaoh deliberately established the labyrinth as both a mirror of the cosmos and a microcosm of Egypt. In doing so, she perpetuated existing beliefs concerning the region's role as the true place of first creation, something that according to the book of the Fayyam was said to have occurred, occurred during the Zep Tepi, the first time. And this refers to the times when the Egyptians, they knew uh, that uh, the giants walked the earth and this was the time of the giant, the giants and the Egyptians, the Zeptepi. And this was the place of reconnecting with that antediluvian power and reconnecting with these antediluvian entities that ruled in the Zeptepi. Last night on the Midnight Ride, we were talking about uh, the, the masters of the reset and how the people that rule the world they they use black magic and sorcery to do it and that's what sebek nefera was doing she was using this i'll read on just a little bit it says did she additionally believe that these creative forces continued to affect the outside world through the power of the god sobek in his role as the active spirit of the local gods of the 42 gnomes of egypt and this literally was a ritual that enabled her to basically bewitch people to keep her in power. This is absolutely nothing but the workings of black magic and sorcery that was at a level that uh, is just really pretty profound and unprecedented. You, sp you spoke of Trinidite, uh, the Trinidite uh, element. You know, one could speculate, you know, how would they, with a nuclear explosion and how that sand 
But is there anything else they have to have? You know, I was thinking of blood components and everything else. Do you have to have a certain, you know, we have iron in our blood. We have other elements. Is there something else you have to have to pull off this trinonite? And then another thing I thought about, if I remember reading and researching in some uh, giants, right? The giants, we can have giants that they have cities that uh, would shine from far off. And I've, I remember reading that they was green, greenish blue. They looked like glass. So, you know, there's that, there's that tie-in. What is going on with all that? You know, and then you have this whole tie-in with Egypt and these different um, archaeology sites. And then we have this, the Sahara Desert not too far from this labyrinth. You know, wonder if it's just one big universal, you know, cauldron. They have to have certain, you know, certain things that harness this type of energy. Like you spoke about ley lines, et cetera. There's certain sites that have more element to correspond with this and then it generates everything to this one access point and then hence you have stargates and etc and then you have let's just say they're accessing information from from above and literally calling forth these you know like we mentioned in mr kircher's uh drawing there his rendering about the 48 gods they're talking to these entities and getting hidden information and always staying a thousand steps ahead of just the average Joe. Right. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, when you hear about the singularity, you hear about these things that are coming around really close. I'm trying to watch what I say on here, but there's certain things that they're trying to pull and nefarious things that's going on in our world today. And I wonder if that's all going to like correspond. Cause if you, if you think about how AI is, if they're able to pull off this stuff and get any more advanced, I don't, I don't think, you know, you know, no wonder God says that he's going to intervene one of these days and there'll be no flesh left alive, you know? And, um, I think that, you know, those days are coming soon because we have these, this whole singular AI merging iron and clay do not mix. You know, we have this emergence, this emergence of, of, of humanity and transhumanism, so to speak. And I think with these these people that we've been talking about, this female Pharaoh, I wonder if they was some of the first ones to pull in and say, let's just say dipping in the pool, so to speak, brother David, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And in, um, here at Hawara, we see a lot of first, uh, a lot of the, uh, people that study these ancient cultures. And we're going to talk about that here in just a moment, how the, the Orphite snake cult, that it spread here from the first time from Hawara. And this was the biggest, uh, the the greatest show on earth, so to speak, in the dark world. Mm -hmm. This lady, uh, Sebek Neferu, that has been uh, such an impact on our modern culture to Mr. Stoker in modern movies. She was a huge figure and a very little known one. But uh, I think it's good for us to know about her because this literally was the start of a lot of things that are being perpetuated. It's being repackaged and it's being forced upon us now uh, in ways that uh, might look scientific. And we've said many times that the scientists are the true priests of the New World Order. And always we see this place where science and the occult blend together. And uh, this is a perfect picture of what we have here at Hawara. Now, we've got a little video here, and what's another one? There's just so much fascinating, compelling things about Hawara. But in 1888, a archaeologist by the name of Flanders Petrie found the foundation of Hawara, he believed. He read the uh, description of Herodotus, and he went and he tried to find the location. And by using the description of Herodotus, he found this huge slab that he believed to be the foundation of the labyrinth. And indeed, huge it was, right where Herodotus had said it was. But what's interesting and very, very compelling, and we're going to see a little bit about this in this little video, that they have now been using ground penetrating radar. And what many people are coming to believe instead of Mr. Petrie finding the foundation of the labyrinth, that what he found was the roof of it, and that the entire labyrinth is there intact, buried in the sand at Hawara. Wow. 
let's let's play this video and see what we got here. This wow, just wow, yes sir, just wow, David. The lost labyrinth of Egypt is a historical and archaeological mystery that has captivated the imagination of researchers and explorers for centuries. It is said to be an enormous and intricate maze-like structure. The first accounts of the lost labyrinth come from the Greek historian Herodotus, who visited Egypt in the 5th century BCE. But there have been countless ancient writers who have described seeing it firsthand. The closest thing we found to it is a massive 300 meter wide stone plateau that some believe was once the foundation of the labyrinth. If it is though, the top stories have been completely lost to time. In 2008, a team of geo-radar specialists scanned the Giza Plateau and found underneath there appears to be an underground labyrinth, just like the one ancient writers described. As of yet though, nobody has ever excavated it or stepped inside. Could the lost labyrinth of Egypt be hidden underneath? The lost labyrinth... I got one for you, David. Just listen to that video. Um... So it's interesting that uh, military applications and there's uh, underground highways, et cetera, especially in the United States, we have a cat, well, let's just say it, we have a honeycomb of different uh, tunnel systems and all kinds of different places that go bump in the night, I guess, if you want to say that, that's underneath the ground, underneath our feet. And I wonder if there's a, you know, you're speaking of the top of the roof, right? Over here in this the labyrinth of Egypt. I wonder if it's just, I wonder if that's where everybody, you know, how you see all these people going missing. You have all these people that are supposedly displaced. I wonder if it's something to do with whatever lies beneath the earth, you know, with these lost labyrinths. What if there's labyrinths underneath here, right here, right here in our just good old American soil, and that's why you have you have missing people, you have tunnel systems, and you have all these other applications when it comes to, you know, cryptic creatures, etc. I wonder if it's something to do with, well, hence, we have labyrinths underneath us, and we, we have yet to discover them, or they have... And they just, you know, took them over in military control, which I believe that last few seconds there, I just said, I believe they took over military control over here. Uh, what do you think, David? Yeah. Well, we've talked about many times the, the dumbs and these underground military bunkers. They're huge. And the not only have we built massive, massive underground facilities and tunnel systems, the Russians also, they have done tremendous uh efforts they the part of the russian theory is that they could defeat us in a nuclear war because they their goal was to have so much underground facilities that they could put enough of their population underground to where they could survive a nuclear war come out rebuild and survive and basically rule the world hmm. and through the underground facilities this is kind of the russian game plan and um this is kind of what we have going on here and it is just absolutely phenomenal that all of these things came together in such a perfect way here uh at hawara and you know i know if little davy run the world if i actually thought that there at hawara there was something buried in the sand more magnificent than the Great Pyramid, and all we had to do was dig it up. Would be there come sun up tomorrow with the shovels. Would be finding out what's going on there. But as far as I know, even in spite of multiple evidence of ground penetrating radar, shown there's definitely something down in there. There's been no, as far as I know, serious efforts from the uh, government of Egypt to excavate. Now, why not? You know, maybe these ancient stories about the labyrinth being the home of these powerful entities that uh, maybe there's really something to that and when we read in scripture about in revelation chapter 9 the abyss being opened and these creatures coming out this is very much biblical this is very much biblical that when the restrainer is removed that we're going to see entities come out and right here is uh one of the huge possibilities here at hawara in this this ancient labyrinth that we have here 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 this is all speculation david but here's here's a thought wonder if they they're scared to do it wonder if it's one of those things if people started you know catching you know catching ground on this and actually have an interest and they go and, and try to excavate these site wonder if it would be so profound that it was something that would be just 
on the mainstream media, just like that, like broadcast across oh, yeah. all, you know I mean? It would be so, it would just take a few seconds and they would just be like, Hey, something, man, man, you know, marvelous. They would, they would, you know, let's just say they would spin it and make it out to be like the best thing ever. Right. So, but my point is it would be something so profound and then they would, people either would disappear or maybe even loss of life. I mean, I'm just all speculation because there might be so, so much electric magnetic energy there that it causes men's hearts to fail. I don't know. And maybe they haven't found the way to uh, combat that area. Maybe that, that's just me. Maybe maybe they don't have the the equipment like the fallen ones, like these, like the first the female pharaohs and the ancient Egyptians. You know, maybe they just don't have the ability like those old ancient Andalusian people did. Maybe maybe there's something yeah. there, David. I don't know. Yeah, if there's something there, like the Minotaur got loose, uh, maybe they're afraid of what they'd do with that bad boy. Yeah, it'd be a it'd be a dark um, it'd be a dark day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's look a little bit at the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and here in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and some of this uh, would give a little parental warning. A lot of this is graphic, as this whole thing is. This is dark. Um, and here in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, on page two hundred and eighty nine, it speaks of that which we can visually see here in the labyrinth, and the labyrinth. We see the 12 boxes that correlate with the 12 signs of the zodiac. And we also see this going down this labyrinth that little, you can literally see that centerpiece going down into the heart of the earth. Now, here in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, here's one quote that talks about the actual going through of a portal that's in a chamber of one of these structures. This is on page 289. And it says, who is this devourer for millions of years is his name. And he dwelleth in the lake of Unt. As concerning the fiery lake, it is that which is hard by the Shanit chamber. And it literally talks about this entity. He's called devourer for millions of years in a fiery lake. And he's hard by this Shanit chamber. They actually talked about chambers in these temples that opened up into these monsters. You know, and this is the lore. It's right in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And this is the entire lore that surrounds the concept of the labyrinth that they indeed would house these entities just like the one in Crete that was uh, the Minotaur. And and it also talks about bulls down there that in uh, page 172. Uh, and it speaks about, and, and here again, forgive me if you have little children, you might want to uh, grab their ears, but it says, uh, bow down to me, those who are in a new, their heads am I, their bull, becoming strong moment by moment, I populate, I have gained strength for millions of years. And over and over throughout the Egyptian Book of the Dead, these entities are spoken of. Uh, many of them are half human, uh, half animal that have existed for eternity and millions of years of they say and on page uh 348 here um uh, the things here in the egyptian book of the dead it's rough stuff here as recorded here in what's called the papyrus of anai it's chop them up eat them up uh away you go and all through uh the egyptian book of the dead they'll say hail devour of a million years as they go through these rituals they encounter entity after entity of these ancient fallen ones. And truly, it is not an exaggeration to call Hawara the labyrinth of the fallen ones. On page 348, I'll just read a little bit here on the Egyptian Book of the Dead. It says, Hail, devourer of blood, who cometh forth from the block of slaughter. Hail, devourer of the inward parts, who cometh forth from Mabet. Hail, thou two-headed serpent, who cometh forth from the torture chamber. I mean, we've got 
all of these uh, entities being evoked. And here, here at the labyrinth, it's like a smorgasbord of demonic contact. You want you, you want to go up, you want to go down. Uh, we've got the 48 gods here, and we'll fix you up, and we'll hook it up. And all through the Book of the Dead, entity after entity, they come in contact with uh, through these dark rituals, the very rituals that Sebek Nefero used to become literally the most powerful person on earth. Now we're going to look at um, a little bit here of this god, the snake god, the little g god. And many people believe that here, and of course when you got uh, Hathor swallowing seven cobras and Sebek Neferu swallowing seven cobras, the what was called the Orphite snake cult. It spread throughout the world and snake worship and serpent worship, you see it all over. And we're going to look a little bit here about the snake god that we encounter in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Nehebkau is his name. And take us through these slides, Brian. And and right away here, what do we see? We see a cobra there, Brian, and we see this little snake's got human feet. You know, what what we got going on here, Brian? Well, I want to point out, too, when we referenced at the beginning of the, of the program, when we mentioned the, the movie Mummy from 2017, and you mentioned the book from Andrew Collins with the female pharaoh. You see the beetle there between the, um, let's just say, the minotaur and the snake, human slash, let's just go there, you know, reptilian, two-legged snake man. Uh, there's the beetle. And it's kind of interesting that beetle is significant throughout Egypt and Egyptology and Egypt culture and the civilizations. But I want to bring out here, too, so you have the cow you have the minotaur-like creature on the left, and then you have the cobra on the right, but then in the middle, you have this convergence. Like I mentioned earlier, you have the human, two legs, and then you have the snake. It's almost like, you know, you're going from, you know, this one section left to right, and there's some kind of symbolic thing coming here that you become enlightened, or whatever the concept is. I just know it reminds me of reptilians. It reminds me of, you know, shapeshifters, all the above, and it also reminds me of some of the research that I've done locally in my area when it comes to resurrection and looking at the serpent and then the concept of a man looking into it and saying, oh, oh my, you know, there, there's some translations from tablets what I've come across from some Indian mounds. Could it be tied back to Egypt? Absolutely. I think and our even in Indiana, all up down through Old Ohio Valley, we have Egyptian culture. We have all that. I mean, there's sarcophagus not too far that was found in my area that would be tied back to Egyptian. And, in, and one would wonder, like you're looking at this minotaur and he's cracking a whip, so to speak. It looks like he's got a whip and he's like hitting the legs of the human-like snake entity. And there's something going on there. And the subduction of the cobra, like you mentioned earlier about people being subdued and going into a trance-like state. And then you have the minotaur there. Hey, he's seeking and devouring and doing something to do with that nefarious beetle there. I don't forget the name of the beetle. I used to know it. That's the first slide. The second slide, here's one that it's got the two-headed snake, like Brother David just mentioned, but you have the yeah. two snakes on left and right. So if you pay attention to this, this goes throughout, not just Egypt, but this has been cited in all kinds of different cultures. Uh, I think in Peru, all kinds of areas where they're holding these two rods, right? It's like holding these two, and you see things, depictions of Cineros, the underworld god, etc. But it reminds me of this picture here, and there's two snakes you're hanging on to. It's almost like you're choosing your left or your right i don't know i mean i just think there's something there with electrical components and it's kind of it's kind of showing you the depiction of the serpentine kind of aspect but it's nefarious either way you look at it that that alone uh is pretty creepy the next one where you have the human bowing to the snake and has the wings so you look at this feathered serpent uh in what we used to yeah. be called here in america and you have somebody giving it looks almost like a sacrifice of something you know, or, or something to drink. And this reminds me of the Hopi prophecy that it is being tied into. And I think it's all one of the same when that comes to Egyptian and all Aztec. There's so many correlations with that and similarities in their tactics and traditions. I think this individual here is giving some type of, let's just say tonic of some shape or form. And they're going to be, 
um, let's just say human-like, humanoid, because that's what happened in the Hopi prophecy. That's how I depict these pictures. What do you say, Brother David? What do you say? Well, most definitely, this is a winged cobra, Mm -hmm. winged serpent. It brings to mind the fiery, fiery, fiery flying serpents we read of in Numbers chapter 21, which is literally translated seraph or seraphim. And it looks just like you say, it looks like there's something black coming out and holding the head of this serpent. And it looks like they're extracting something out of the serpent, putting it into a jar, obviously for some kind of a ritual of transformation or who knows what. But it is certainly uh, speaking to the depths of these rituals of the intermingling of the animal and the human DNA. And this was taken to new levels here at uh, Hawara. And uh, we're really on ground zero of this. And this Neheb cow, he was the half animal, half snake god that was worshipped. And he became much of the uh, foundation of the Orphite snake cult that was just spread all over the ancient world. And one of the coffin texts here, uh, one of the coffin texts, spell 85, he started the cobra swallowing thing. Wow. It says uh, in spell 85 of the coffin text, Neb Cow swallowed seven cobras to consume their heka and gain magical power. Elsewhere in spell 374, the seven Uriah snakes are said to afterward become seven of the gods' vertebrae. Now, uh, this goes back to the foundation of Freemasonry, the 33 degrees correlating to the 33 uh, vertebrae in the spine, raising the kundalini serpent fire up the spine into the pineal gland, the opening of the third eye. And we see this on steroids here. It says from various references, I'm reading here from Mr. Collins, to the swallowing of the seven Uriah snakes to gain Heka magic found in the pyramid text, we know that the vertebrae in question were those that support the neck. So we've got um, some dark, dark stuff here. Wow. But what we can be very, very encouraged and blessed by is that the Lord is allowing us to understand these things, that we can be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And we can see these things coming at us right now. I, You know, we look at these things all the time and talk about them, and so many of our friends do also. And it's hard to imagine how people can't see it. But many, many people cannot see it. And that's what we do, what we do to open the eyes of people under the reality of the dark realm and its superiority of the power of God that people can turn to Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus, let me tell you, you need to get to know him tonight before you go to bed. You need to repent and believe the gospel and accept that death of Christ upon the cross as payment of your sin debt and commit your life to Jesus Christ. And it's it's just really coming down at a point in time where we see in these cities lost in time that they're the impact that they have on our culture right now. And everyone we look at, Brian, it just seems like more of the dots connect and the picture just becomes a little bit clearer. Absolutely. There's nothing. I mean, it's it, the father is pouring out his spirit. There's nothing hidden. It's it's literally everything is just being exposed. It seems like in the last few years, there's more, you know, if this is 100 years ago when we had this a, this capability of doing this on air or whatnot and televising, we wouldn't have any half, I mean, we wouldn't have thousands of percentage of what we have now. Like, we wouldn't have any of this. We'd be sitting yeah. here completely oblivious to what this stuff is. So, you know, it's baffling to me that here we are and we have, and we still have the ability to, you know, access the material and then put the pieces together and it's it's so baffling to know that we are in these times and these things that are devouring and literally bamboozling and making the this as far as the serpent the snake they have the there's the veil has been covering their eyes and they can't see past the scales 
it's just baffling to me, David. And this, this tonight, I've heard stuff that I've never heard before. And man, Harara, man, the labyrinth of the fallen ones. What a what a awesome program, and I've, I've been blessed to be part of it tonight, brother David. So yeah, four well, four segment, four segment to our yeah. city's awesome time. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I can't thank you enough for all of your work on the slides and the thumbnail and the intro, just pristine work. And it's just a joy to work with you in this endeavor. And we're going to be rolling out many more episodes and uh, many more revelations in the cities lost in time, because as we do, uh, there's so much important information. And I know I'm the same way. When I began studying Hawara, I learned things that I never knew before, you know, and, uh, Knowledge uh, increases sorrow, but also we need to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Uh, it, it's sad when we when we learn these things, we see the grip that Satan has on the world. But it's all about the Israel of God and about God speaking to people, opening their eyes, turning people from the power of darkness to the power of light. So if you like this broadcast tonight, hit the like button. Uh, share this video out, subscribe to FOJC Radio Underground Church, subscribe to Visual Disturbance, uh, Brian Reese's channel. It's our, our dedicated goal to do everything we can to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to uh, everyone we can. And it's just, uh, just such a blessing to see the Lord honoring our humble efforts. So, Brian, any final thoughts before we close out episode number four of the cities lost in time, Hawara, Labyrinth of the Fallen Ones? Well, David, I was just glad to be a part of it, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, and thank you all for attending with us tonight. It's been a, it's been a very, it's just a pleasure for uh, seeing all familiar people, and welcome new subscribers to the channel too, also. And um, thank you for walking this out like we are, and. And I hope it was edifying to everybody. And walking that narrow path of Christ is not easy in these days. But uh, I pray everybody enjoyed the program. And uh, I was glad to be part of it, Brother David. And thank you for allowing me to be, be here. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Brian. And we're just going to close this broadcast out. Like, say, all of our new listeners for the first time. And I know some of you for the first time in the chat. We welcome you. And uh, we're so thankful that you... Uh, took time to consider FOJC Radio. So with that, we're going to close out this broadcast this evening, this episode of Sunday Night Live, and we're just going to say that until next Sunday night, 7 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody, from FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live. God bless you all.